Okay, well, it's seven o'clock, so we will get started. Uh, welcome everyone to another edition of our virtual Cangio Talks series. My name is Alex Pope. I'm the digital editor at Canadian Geographic, and I'm so delighted that you could be here with us this evening. I think you're really gonna find tonight's presentation uh, really beautiful and interesting. Before we get going and before I introduce tonight's speaker, I just have a couple of things that I wanna let you know about. The first of which is that this weekend, this Sunday, May 31st, we are going to be streaming the finals of the Canadian Geographic Challenge on our YouTube channel right here. Um, this is a huge national geo geography competition. Uh, students across the country in grades seven to 10 have competed at the classroom, the school and the provincial or territorial level to make it to the national final. Normally they would all descend on Ottawa this weekend to participate in the final rounds of testing. Obviously with COVID-19, we weren't able to make that happen. So we're doing it virtually this year and it all culminates in the live final on Sunday where the top five students will compete for cash prizes and the title of national champion. It's gonna be super fun and exciting. It's kind of a live Jeopardy style competition so if you love geography trivia and you want to cheer on these amazing young geographers, uh, consider tuning in. The event starts at 2 p.m. Eastern time, and that's right here on YouTube. Uh, the second thing that I want to tell you about is uh, subscriptions. <laughs> if you've been thinking about getting a subscription to Canadian Geographic magazine, uh, we have an exciting promo for you this evening just for the occasion of this talk. Um, you can go to canadiangeographic.ca slash subscribe and enter promo code HOPE30 to get 30% off a one-year subscription to Canadian Geographic magazine. That's HOPE30. And Angelica, our social media editor, who's going to be monitoring the live chat tonight, will also tell you where to go in the comments. So HOPE30, and I hope you'll consider signing up for a subscription to the magazine if you like the kind of content that we're producing online for you right now. Um, and related to that, if you like the content that we're producing online for you right now, please consider making a donation to the Royal Canadian Geographical Society to help support our programming. Um, even small amounts go a long way to help towards helping us put on more of these events and supporting great programs like the Canadian Geographic Challenge. So there's a couple of ways that you can contribute. You can make a donation right in the live chat here on YouTube or you can even send us an e-transfer to donations at rcgs.org. That's donations at rcgs.org. And once again, Angelica will hook you up with that email address in the chat. If you have a couple of bucks to spare to support the Royal Canadian Geographical Society in our important work of making Canada better known to Canadians and the world. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce tonight's speaker. We have with us tonight, Michelle Valberg, she is an adventurer, an explorer, and obviously a photographer. Um, and I'm sure many of you watching are familiar with Michelle's work. She is a photographer in residence for Canadian Geographic. She is a Canadian Nikon ambassador. Now, normally she specializes in the Canadian Arctic, um, but tonight she's gonna tell you about how the COVID-19 pandemic has sort of inspired her to reframe her work uh, and focus on some different subject matter for her. So take it away, Michelle. I'm super glad to have you here. Oh, thank you so much for the introduction, Alex. It's really great to be here virtually and uh, kind of weird to be talking to a computer and not to people. Uh, it's always fun to be in a crowd and to feel the energy, but um, I will try to I will try to rein that in virtually from, from all of you. Thank you for taking the time to come and, uh, and join us this evening on, uh, on Can Geo Talk. Super happy as a Canadian Geographic uh, photographer in residence and Nikon ambassador uh, to be with you tonight, tonight talking uh, a little different, I think, from uh, what you have seen from me in the past. So I'm just gonna prepare uh, my PowerPoint here and I'm going to start it. And I was making the title for tonight. Alex, can you see that okay? Uh, it hasn't come up yet, but just give it a minute. And if not, try it again. Okay, because I don't, I've lost the, um... oh, I didn't do the screen share that. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. <laughs> Always share your screen. Oh, that is kind of important. <laughs> okay, hang on, screen share. 
host disabled participant host disabled participant screen sharing <laughs> What? Okay. Sorry, everyone watching. I'm now going to attempt to troubleshoot <laughs> this live. <laughs> Isn't that weird? That is really strange. Hmm. Okay. Try it now. Ah, I there we go. We're good. <laughs> sure. Thanks that's everyone for your patience. We're <laughs> live TV folks. <laughs> well, that's the beauty, right? Of of all this live virtual zooming, Skyping. I mean, this is what it's all about. It's reality right here. So um, thanks for thanks for staying with us uh, through that little hiccup. But anyways, we're here. And I'm going to be talking to you about before and during COVID-19. And I was coming up with the title for my first slide and uh, just before and after and it's like oh no i can't say after at all um it is before and during COVID 19 and i hope you are all safe and healthy and continuing to self-isolate or self-distance um make sure that when you're out you're keeping that two meter uh distance from other people and let's let's all work together to uh, make sure that we don't have a second wave during this uh during this pandemic and um, keep everybody safe. And we're looking forward to being back up and running and uh, fully out there as, as much as we can. But life has certainly changed a lot. So the little bit before I wanna take you on a journey to Africa, um, just a month before COVID-19 hit, Canada and our world changed and a state of emergency were declared through most of our country. I had experienced Africa and uh, what an amazing journey it was. And it was one of those uh, lifelong um, uh, adventures that I had wanted to take with my family. My son, Ben, and my husband, Scott, came with, and we had a wonderful group of people that joined us, and we went to Tanzania. And uh, it's hard to believe this was just February. And this is uh, me I'm photographing uh, in the Goro Goro crater. Thanks to Bridget for, for this image. Um, we landed in Arusha and, and we spent the first night before going uh, up to the Serengeti. We spent uh, a couple of nights in this beautiful game lodge called Mount Miru. And uh, we took a, a couple hours and spent um, discovering Usa, the, uh, the city next to where we were staying. And it was incredible to walk through the community and see the vibrant uh, community um, selling their produce and so much color. When we arrived back in uh, when we arrived back in Canada, it was interesting because it was winter, obviously, and there was so much black. Um, uh, everybody wears dark colors, and and when you're in these African countries, there is just so much life and and so much color and personality that we were seeing. And uh, a lot of times when I was walking through the through the community, I just shot from the hip. I literally I I shoot with the Nikon Z6 and the Z7 easy, simple. I had uh, the 24 millimeter on and I just shot um, from my hip and uh, I didn't want to really interfere and feel like I was going to change their, maybe their uh, uh, reaction to me. I wanted it to be as natural as possible. And uh, I really came up with some interesting concepts, some really cool ways of showcasing the people living in this beautiful uh, little community. And even you know, when I was going, I was just trying to find pieces. I wasn't necessarily trying to find the broad or I always look to go um, a little bit closer in, you know, where I love that you could see the environment. I could love that you could see where these people are, but it was really neat to be able to hone in a little bit as well. And, uh, and um, you know, capture a little bit of the, uh, the, what was happening in the, in the community by color, um, by reaction. It was really fun to explore the people before we were off to uh, to just be with the with the animals in the Serengeti. This was an orphanage that we went to. A beautiful little girl just posed for me. I had seconds, and one of the things that I find when I'm out in the communities and I'm walking around trying to photograph the people is you have to be really really quick. Um, you know, it's it's a, a lot like um, photographing wildlife. And I tried to make it as natural as possible, allowing the subject just to be, you know, without interfering. And I am a studio photographer as well. So I'm always photographing people 
in controlled situations when I'm in the studio as well. And, uh, you know, you have the makeup and you have the hair and you have the, uh, the lights and you have the opportunity to tell that person how to pose if they're heads up or down or, you know, retake. And, and when you're in the environment, you have to think really, really quickly. And just, uh, you know, trying to capture that right look, that right moment is, uh, is so critical to making that image absolutely perfect. And working with the light always, I love backlight and looking at lines and textures and the way that the light is falling on the subject. And as I said, there was so much color to, uh, to photograph there. Um, you know, just, just I love this, um, that the way that she was posing so naturally. Uh, you know, you, you think that you tried to pose this, you would probably never achieve this kind of uh, portrait if you're in control. This was one of my favorite of all, and we were walking down this busy, busy uh, market. And again, I was just shooting from the hip. And this is an image that I got just from not even looking at, at my viewfinder or through my viewfinder, but just shooting and, and seeing what fun you could capture. And you know, certainly when back to the days of film, for those of you who, who photographed uh, with film, you know, you had to be so conscious of 24 exposures and 36 exposures and everything was manual. Now with um, digital and, and the larger card, card formats, you know, it's easy to just, just shoot. All you can do is delete after if you don't like anything, but it's the magic that happens around the, the unknown when you can photograph from the hip. It's super fun. When we were staying at the lodge as well, it was perfect because we had uh, monkeys, we had the colobus monkey, um, which is, this was a very, very tricky situation to, to photograph looking up. Our necks were killing her, uh, killing us after looking up for so long. Um, certainly in the difficult lighting conditions, the, the stark difference between the, the darks and the, and, the, um, and the highlights or the shadows and the highlights. But it was awesome because we had a couple of days just to play around and, and photograph the monkeys that we had around. Um, we also had a zebra at Peacock. We had water buffalo. Um, so it was an awesome way to, again, just introduce ourselves to the beautiful African wildlife that we were going to see. I just love this photo. It was just the way that the mom was looking at the baby, picking, picking at her, and uh, just that care and that beauty. And one of the things that I, I try to do, not only with wildlife photography, but with portraits as well, um, is just, you know, getting that emotional contact and or that creating that emotional impact. Uh, with your imagery that we can all relate to. And ultimately what we want for, for our viewers is to spend time with their photos, you know, so that they, they don't just come through, they're not looking through their, through their phone and, and going like this, but they're actually stopping and staring and spending time with your image and creating their own story perhaps of what it is that they're, that they're seeing. Ultimately, that's what I want anyway. I think that everybody is out there that is a photographer wants more people to spend time with your photos and to really appreciate them. And sometimes we have stories behind our images that, that make it a little bit more special to us. And, and it's really wonderful when we have the platform of social media to be able to um, showcase your, your work, but also tell the stories to go along with it. So people really dig a little bit deeper into your image as well. We had uh, arrived in the Serengeti and um, saw these two male giraffe. Obviously, one is, is smaller than the other. And one of the things that I had never seen in Africa before was the necking that the giraffes do to, um, to, uh, for dominance, uh, for mating. And, um, and when they interfere with each other or they fight, probably it reminded me of watching polar bears or um, the grizzlies that um, that spar and uh, watching these two was amazing. I had never seen anything like this. And uh, this young guy was just whamming his neck up against um, the uh, larger male's neck and really, um, really forcefully pushing himself off um, into his neck. It was incredible to watch. It was almost like a dance. Anyway, I have a little bit of video. It's um, it's uh, really cool to be able to see this in, in live as well. And that's one of the things that I'm always striving for, um, you know, not only to try to capture that still, but also um, try to, when you have that still, if that's your priority, to capture the motion that goes along with it, because it tells so much more of a story uh, when you're able to showcase something in the action that it is actually happening in the moment. And you can see the power 
um, that this little guy was just just ramming the other guys. And it was almost like he was, it, there was no female around. You wonder if he was practicing, uh, we slow it down here. Look at the force, it's just incredible to watch these two creatures going, um, going at the, the, they call it necking. He missed a little bit there and coming back. It was just such a, it was just such a thrill to, to be able to see that kind of action. And to actually have the opportunity to film it, you know, once I had I thought that I had gotten the still that I had wanted, um, sometimes, you know, the motion of, of the video is much more of an impact than the actual still. So when, if you haven't, if you have a DSLR, or if you have a mirrorless, um, you know, and you haven't tried the video aspect of, uh, of your camera, try it because it's really easy now. So simple and uh, and really worth it. And you can take it home and show people what it was like to actually be in that in that situation and see those animals live. We had elephants. We had a herd of twenty or thirty um, elephants that were a little bit further off in the acacia trees, and they just kept moving forward and forward. We had stopped to look at them at a distance, and they just kept moving towards us, right towards us. And these two younger uh, elephants, you know, again, it's the emotional impact, you know, the trunks intertwined with one another. Um, they started walking uh, by our vehicle. Uh, the power and the glory of seeing us in those little babies. I mean, how incredible. Uh, I look at these, I hope, I hope whoever's been to Africa has, um, you know, obviously you can connect to this and who wants to go to Africa. Uh, makes you want to go that much more. I'm just so blessed to have been able to have had these experiences not that long ago, and and I'm so thrilled to be able to share them with you. This is my son with his with his iPhone. I mean, this is how close they just all of a sudden surrounded us, and then went right beside us and started eating, and just looked at us like we were just not even not even there. You know, they just kind of went on their way and uh, and ate up the grass. You could feel, you could hear, you could uh, smell um, the grasses as they were eating them. It was incredible. Um, just ha had their way and then and then off they walked into, oh, like we can say into the sunset. Uh, one of the things that was interesting about uh, being in Tanzania this time is it had rained every day from October until the day before that we got there. So the grasses were huge, it's kind of like, all of our hairs after after COVID, <laughs> um, you know the the grasses were so high. I I can't even imagine the amount of wildlife or the amount of cats that maybe that we passed by and we didn't even know. And I, you know the intuition and the the guides and their incredibly um, uh, visual acuity that when they when they see something they know they've got it. And this lion was lying deep in the grass and. All you could see in the wind was this a little teeny tiny bit of his mane uh, in the in the wind above the grass, and our guide, who would we would have never found, um, saw it and stopped the stopped the jeep right away, and uh, and we waited and waited and waited, and finally um, this beautiful male um, lion picked up and looked at us, and then went back. It was the middle of the day, but beautiful, beautiful scene, and it was so green compared to the year. Uh, or two years prior that I had been there as well. This was kind of an each shot, you know, it was another lion, a, a different scenario. And it wasn't until I went back in that I, that I, ca that I actually saw what I captured and I showed our group. And I said, look, look, and many of them also had this image and you could actually see our vehicle in the reflection of the, of the eye. Talk about a great selfie, right? When you can get yourself in the vehicle in the lion's eye. It's just being in tune and, and really looking deep in your images and maybe doing different cropping, you know, seeing how that you can rework your image from, from what the regular, you know, if you don't have an opportunity to get close, how can you crop, what can you see, what can you look or make, how can you make this image look different? Always in my mind when I'm looking through the images, it's not just seeing, I try to frame when I'm photographing, I try to frame for what my final result is. That's not always easy when you're when you're out in the wild. Um, so I, I look at framing things different and cropping, and uh, sometimes you find these these little nuggets as well. We had amazing encounters with um, with cheetahs, with lions, all kinds of cats. We were in the middle of the migration. We had a, a 
hundred thousand, you know, I don't know, thousands and thousands of wildebeest, and we were right in the middle of the migration. And you had all these cats that were surrounding the migration as well. We never did see a kill, um, uh, but we certainly saw the aftermath of, of the kills um, that the that the animals had had with the wildebeest. But wow, what a what an honor and a and a gift to be able to be amongst these animals in in their environment. Even the flamingos were so much fun to watch. I um I had taken the 800 millimeter with me. I I usually travel with three cameras. And one is a Z6 and the, and the other two are a Z7. I'm fully mirrorless now. And because I brought my son and my husband with me, I was able to bring a little bit extra equipment because they don't take pictures. Thank goodness. Um, so I brought the 800 millimeter loan from, from Nikon, which was fantastic to be able to get a little bit further reach. I have the 500 millimeter PF on another Z7 and or the Z6. And then I have the 70 to 200. So, I'm always working my in, uh, my lenses according to what my needs are. Uh, I always have the 2470 or even the 1430 as well in my bag close by in case I want a wider angle lens as well. So I'm fully prepared. It's kind of obnoxious to have that much equipment, um, but um, you know what? It's when it's what you do for a living. It's kind of what 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 makes it all come together when you have these opportunities. So this was taken with the 800 millimeter, but Again, just watching the way that these in uh, these flamingos, the birds, or whatever subject that you have in front of you are interacting with each other and just waiting for that perfect moment where all the heads are positioned the way that you want them to be to make that composition really stand out for, for your image. Watching the hippos, oh, there's all kinds of action, um, you know, and just being prepared again, just waiting, anticipating. You know, if you have the time, it's really awesome when you're able to um, to watch their behavior and be able to see, okay, they're under the water, they're gonna come up. Um, there's another male over there. So there's so much more going on. Not only do you have to know your, your camera gear and your settings and be prepared and be in the right place at the right time, but you have to be creative and also um, ready for, for anything to happen. So being uh, mindful and really watching the way that the animals are acting and anticipating their behavior really makes a difference in, in capturing a moment some, as, as this. It took a long time. It takes a lot of images. I get to show you my best, um, but it takes a lot of images, obviously. We all know that as photographers to get to something uh, that, you're, that you're happy with. So as part of the, Tanzania was amazing. It was incredible. I got to bring my son and my husband, as I said, but the second part was Uganda. And unfortunately, my husband and, and son uh, had to come home, and I uh, uh, rotated a few people. Some people of my, some of my group from Tanzania continued on to Uganda, and we picked up a few along the way. And, and a, a few had actually had to go home, unfortunately. Um, Uganda had been one of those places that, when somebody said to me, "Where would you like to go? Uh, where you haven't been? Uh, what would your, what would your answer be?" And for me, it was definitely Uganda or Rwanda. Uh, I wanted to see the mountain gorillas. I wanted to see the chimps more than anything. And in February, at the end of February, this got to be realized and I'm so incredibly thankful. Uh, we went to Uganda, it was extraordinary. And I had heard amazing things about Uganda and uh, the scenery blew my mind. Um, the, tea, uh, the tea farms, uh, the people, the wildlife that we saw as well, and of course the ultimate of um, being able to see the chimps and the gorillas. What surprised me, I guess, was also the scenery and the other wildlife that we were able to see. Our primary focus was the chimps and the gorillas. We had two treks with each, but being able to go through Queen Elizabeth Park and see the lions, seeing a herd, um, it was what a dream come true. It was extraordinarily beautiful. And uh, I had said to my guide when we got there, okay, we didn't see leopards in Tanzania. So leopards are on my on the list, okay? Just saying. And uh, one day when we went for a safari in Queen Elizabeth Park, um, we were able to see this mom and her and her um, her baby hunting, which was incredible. These creatures are so magnificent what a gift to be able to see leopards in the wild. And we also saw lots and lots of, of elephants. And I chose this one probably because 
you have all the sets of eyes and the layers. And that's another thing when I'm not only photographing like you have with the with the uh, leopard, you know, post, you have that eye to eye contact, which is so powerful, I think, with wildlife photography. But when you're able to show the animals in their environment, but also see all those sets of eyes and have the layers. So I'm always looking at how my background relates to my to my subject as well. Sometimes you can control it. Obviously, you're in state, you know, in civility, you're on a beanbag, you're in a vehicle with other people. It's not like you have the ability to move quickly or even, you know, six inches to the right or to the left to make a difference, but uh, just waiting and anticipating. And uh, and for the, me, this one, it was really great to have uh, those six ele elephants and have some eye on me in, in this image. Again, it's just the layers that I love so much. We got to visit with the Batwa people. They're, they're um, the former pygmies that lived in the mountain forest. They invited us into their, into their community. Um, and that was a real gift. We got to dance with them, hear their stories, how they lived uh, amongst the mountain gorillas in, in the rainforest. Um, it was a, a real beautiful time that we had and they allowed us into their into their homes and into their hearts. And um, it was so much fun to dance with them. It poured rain and um, yeah, it was just the, the drumming, everything that was happening at the time. It was uh, really, really special and um, definitely a highlight of, of Uganda as well. Our first day with the chimps. Okay, so I spent a lot of time in the Arctic, as Alex said. I spent a lot of time on ship. And uh, lucky for me, I don't get seasick. And, um, but I do get altitude sickness. So this kind of posed a little bit of an issue with me. Um, we all, our bodies react differently. And for me, as soon as I landed in Uganda, and by the time we got to, um, I felt a little funny, but by the time we got to our resort, I, I knew there was something really wrong. And I spent the entire time really not, not feeling well at all. And our first day, um, a full day that we had, we went um, uh, walk, trekking with, with the chimps. Again, just a lifelong dream of mine. And uh, uh, yeah, it was one of the toughest things. You know, it was, we were probably at about 7,000 feet. Um, and then we had to climb uh, some levels and it's just enough for me uh, to react through nausea and headache and um, just a lack of breath and it was pretty pathetic but fortunately I had some really great people with me that helped me along the way and thank God for them because <laughs> I don't know what I would have done. Um, it was, so you've got these, this physicality uh, issue that's going on and you want to create and you only have an hour. There are so many things going on at the same time. And uh, being able to be so close to these chimps, to hear them, um, to watch them in their environment. Um, wow, I, I don't know, it was just, it's so mind blowing to experience something that you, you had always wanted to see, even though you were feeling as bad as, uh, as I was. Um, it's amazing, right? Because adrenaline kicks in and and it kind of takes over. And as soon as the hour was up, and as soon as our time with the chimps was up, I just kind of, I kind of crashed for sure. Um, but yeah, you're, and at the same time, you're just trying to create, you're trying to look, you're not sure you've never been with the chimps before. You're not exactly sure what you're supposed to do, if you're supposed to follow them, what you're supposed to do. So um, anyway, there was a lot of learning involved, let's just say. And then this guy, this is the one that was sitting there. He just got up and walked right beside me. And uh, I was hopeful he would sit down next to me, but that didn't happen. Um, but anyway, it was really cool to, to be brushed by, by a chimp. And it was over like that. And um, anyway, it's just, again, one of those lifelong experiences that I had always wanted to have. And next up was the grill. So if I thought it was bad trying to, trying to track chimps, it was a, super, super hard. Uh, when it came time to the gorillas, we had uh, our first day. We had we had started out at around seven thousand feet, and we had a three-hour trek to the gorillas. And uh, it wasn't bad at first, actually. And then uh, we had to go into the into the uncut portion and uh, find our way up a mountain or two. And uh, as we kept approaching 
the uh, trackers were following them and they were moving that much further away from us. So they were on the move, we were on the move and um, yeah, it was, we thank, thankfully I had um, a wonderful porter that was there to help. Uh, we had some trees and branches and hills and climbs um, that we had to do. And uh, as soon as we arrived at the family, it started to thunderstorm and bucket rain. I mean, I'm telling you, it was like the massive downpour. So not only am I altitude sickness, but I hate storms. <laughs> so here I am going, all right, I am right in the moment of realizing my lifelong dream and I've got a thunderstorm and I'm, I'm altitude sickness and I've got an hour. And my pack was in, or my, my camera was in my backpack, which was on the porter, which was covered by a, uh, a plastic cover, a plastic uh, cape that I brought from my parents actually. And um, I had taken off my lens cover, my, uh, not my lens cover, but my lens uh, coat, um, because it hadn't been raining. So note to self, always be prepared. And when you think it's not going to rain, um, expect that it maybe will, because you're in the rainforest. I don't know, maybe. Um, so I had to, we arrived and fortunately my friend Chris was beside me and she said, let's get this out. So she uh, knew that I was struggling because I had to somehow get my camera out of my backpack, out of the backpack that was on my porter in like buckets, buckets pouring rain coming down without a cover and I only had an hour. So um, she held the raincoat actually over top of the backpack and I was able to reach in, get my camera, get my lens coat on or my lens cover on, which was you know, in my pockets and um, pull it out, get it all assembled and then and then try to create in the pouring rain. Uh, the, the family had scattered a little bit. Um, it was dark, uh, working your camera, working your ISO, uh, making sure that you're you're not going too high, that you're, um, I was, I had the 70 to 200 on, so I was at 2.8. I upped my ISO to about 5,000 where I was comfortable to see where I could get my my shutter too, and uh, I managed to, to work with that exposure. And I think for me, this was one of those uh, images that I wanted to walk away from. I didn't care if I had anything else. I wanted eye to eye, I wanted a portrait of, of a gorilla. So for me, this was a hugely important image for me to create. Um, this was a black back and he was the one that was out and most exposed. Uh, he was sitting in the, in the rain, he was making his bed. And uh, he spent time with us, and and uh, it was really incredible. the The former photo, this one, was the black, uh, was the silver back that was just sitting there, not making any motion, like he was really not happy about it pouring rain. Uh, but this guy was out there and uh, and really, really uh, performing for us. Thankfully, um, we had uh, a couple of babies uh, close by. This was actually the second day. Um, and amazing to be able to watch the mother and child uh, or infant um, behavior. We are so much of them and just, you can see it in their eyes. You can see it in their mannerisms. You can see it in their hands. Um, it was incredible to actually watch. So I'm gonna go back to the black back and, and he sat there, he was making his bed and, uh, and he was picking his nose and he was eating it. He was farting, I mean, it was, he had us all smiling. And at one point it was just like, you know what? I think I have to just put down my camera. I wanted, I wanted to just look at this, uh, at this amazing creature that I have in front of me. And, uh, you know, he smiled. Oh, it looks like he smiled at us. He was so proud. And uh, a couple of days before I had gone to Uganda, I had a dream that a silverback had come over and put his arm around me. And, um, and I wasn't able to take a picture in the hour that I had because I had a silver back with his armor on it. So secretly, I kind of wanted that to happen. And uh, so I was staring um, eye to eye with this black back, just hoping, hoping that he would come over and sit next to me um, secretly. Uh, but uh, when he did get up and walk directly towards me and the rest of us, uh, because they're always walking towards you, right? When they're when you're out there, it doesn't matter if there's ten other people behind you. It's always that they're walking towards you. Uh, a friend of mine captured this. Michelle captured this on on his uh, on his iPhone. So I want to share with you because it was really unbelievable. This is the moment that this black back got up and walked directly towards me. So there I am in the hat. He walks by. He walks by the rest of us. And when he gets to my friend Chris, he's filming. 
I need to shovel. <laughs> we were absolutely in shock. We couldn't believe that this happened. And of course, Chris was, Chris was like not really quite sure what had happened and if he was walking away from her or if he was still there. Um, anyway, it was one of those most unbelievable scenes. And uh, so glad it happened for Chris. It was, it was incredible. Um, he had walked off and uh, by that time she turned around uh, and saw that he was walking away and just broke out in tears because she had been touched uh, by a gorilla. It was incredible. Of course, I wanted it to be me, but I am so happy, Chris, that it happened to you because it was just, uh, of course, all the porters are staring, thinking that she was hurt because she was just crying and she was crying in joy. Uh, wow, what a gift. Uh, this was one of the images I think that was the most powerful for me that I walked away with. Uh, again, it's a different crop than what I'm, I'm typically uh, doing with my work. Um, it's the eye, it's the expression, it's the hand holding um, the, the leaf that he was eating. And um, yeah, it just, I don't know, it, it speaks to me. And, and uh, yeah, it, it was definitely the image that I walked away with going, okay, this is, this is something that I could be really, really proud of. So I put together a quick little video. Again, it was like, we have a little bit of amount of time. Should I be shooting video? Shouldn't I? Um, and I'm really glad I did. So here's a little bit of uh, video and uh, combined with photos from um, the mountain gorillas as well. This is a black back. I do have music, but it was, was feeding back. So I, I muted it, but um, I'll just let you guys look. There he is, making his bed and wiping himself off. And that one as well, where he was pounding his chest. Wow, it was remarkable. So after all that, I uh, experienced like lifelong dreams. Uh, it was incredible. I don't know how many thousands, did I do 20,000 images? I don't know, a lot, let's just say. I, uh, I got home, I recovered a little bit, tiny bit. And then uh, I took off and went to Vancouver Island for another lifelong dream. I really wanted to see the, the coastal wolf and I wanted to experience the herring run. So my friend Tom McPherson, uh, he owns the Fourth Adventures, um, started this, uh, this little tour. And uh, we happened to be fortunate to experience uh, this uh, beautiful area in Vancouver Island in the Great Barrier Rainforest with him. Just five days after coming back from from Africa. I don't know if I really knew what, what time zone I was on, but it didn't matter. I mean, look at this beauty. Uh, the Great Bear Rainforest is one of the most magnificent places I've ever seen in this world. And uh, this was an area that I hadn't seen before. And um, I was super, super excited about the potential of seeing um, coastal wolves. So the herring run in this area that we are in is actually protected. And um, there is still commercial fishing, fishery uh, um, happening on the other side of the island. Um, but this is an aerial that was taken from a drone. My friend uh, Jim had a drone and he allowed me to take the picture. So I would have, uh, have a, an image that I could share that was my own, so to speak, even though he was flying the drone and uh, shows the, the herring run and uh, the massive amount of spawning that was happening in this small little cove uh, where we were visiting. All kinds of biodiversity and animal behavior happened at the time of the spawn. The black bears come down to feed off of the rope, the eagles, the birds, the gray whales, uh, the humpbacks, orcas come in as well. We didn't see those, but um, the coastal wolves are out, the sea lions, everybody's super happy about uh, about this time of year and uh, the opportunity to feed on the on herring. This is a close-up shot of um, of the row that attached to kelp. Um, again, just you know, trying to find those nuggets um, within this massive, beautiful um, environment that we were in, and uh, incredible to see the um, the eggs that were attached to rocks and and the kelp around the islands and in the coves that we were that we were visiting. A lot of my times we were in the rainforest. This is kind of how um, how it looked. 
again, I'm working with at least two cameras. I probably have three. Important to not only make sure that you stay dry if you can or warm in cold climate, but also keeping your camera gear uh, protected as well. I use think tank covers uh, in this kind of condition just because you need all the protection you've got when you've got bucket rain coming down at you. You might be in a boat, you might be on land and uh, you need all the protection that you've got. Um, so the first day that we are there, we are having breakfast, we are getting ourselves prepared and Louise, our, our beautiful friend and chef, looked out and saw wolves on the island next to us and she just screamed, wolf, I, you should have seen us how quickly we moved. We got in the boat and uh, we were able to reverse around, the tide was high enough that we were able to get around and I have a really great vantage point. And as we were making our way up um, this little uh, estuary, the wolves uh, from the island were actually crossing the water to swim uh, to meet the, the rest of the pack. And again, it was just timing. I and mean, we was just so lucky to be um, there when it all happened. If you hear anything in the background, it's my dog eating and drinking water. <laughs> if you're wondering what that noise is. Anyway, the, the joys of live TV. So uh, they crossed the water and, uh, and they met up with their, with their pack. And uh, it was just incredible. It was like seeing the, the gorillas. And this was, this was just, you know, the, just before COVID-19 had, um, had affected us all. So I, I look at these and I, I remember the feeling of being in this wilderness and, and amongst these um, creatures and how lucky and blessed I, I felt. And, uh, and then this one that was on the left walked a little bit closer towards us and stood on the rocks and held at us for about 45 seconds to a minute. I don't know, it felt like 10. I don't know how long it was, but he just howled and, uh, and stared at us and just like, hey, what are you doing? And, and I, am, I am the leader here and, and um, I am the alpha. And he howled and then walked, they all walked into the woods. It was, it, I remember standing there on the boat just going, did that really happen? Did I actually see that? It was incredible. So the next morning we went out fully prepared. We were hoping the same uh, for the same. Of course, it never happens the same. We positioned ourselves. We knew where to go. Uh, that was our first day. So we thought we had a little bit more intuition and a little bit more knowledge of what they might do. The tide was different. Every day is different. The light is different. And then uh, we were prepared and then um, the moon, we have a super moon was setting. Or it, it was, it was um, yeah, it was setting. Uh, we were out at, at 6 a.m. and uh, um, we, were, we saw this wolf come out of the wolves and he was walking towards the island. And we thought, is he gonna walk in front of the, in front of the full moon? Like, are we actually gonna have a wolf in a full moon? Could this possibly be? And I had the 800 millimeter. I'm shooting with the 800 on tripod. I had the 500 next to me and I had my 70 to 200 in my backpack uh, that was on the ground a little bit further away from me. And uh, he walked up and uh, the sky was turning pink. It was glorious. And I had to make the decision. And, and sometimes it was like, you know, you, you regret or sometimes you go, okay, well, I'm going to make this decision. And I know that I may miss something, but I knew that 500, the, the moon was still a little bit high. I, I didn't think I would be able to get the, the wolf and the moon in. And so I stayed with my 800 millimeter. Uh, Jim and Tom both got the full moon with the, with the wolf as he crossed um, over to the island, which is magnificent, it's good for them. I was super happy, but I had to make that choice. And sometimes um, we have to, and, and we have to be happy with what we have. And I'm certainly not disappointed by any means. This is one of my favorite images from the trip. Um, because it was a distance away and uh, I had this beautiful setting. So sometimes we have to make those choices and always be happy with the ones that you do, you, you do make because that was, I believe that was kind of what was meant for, was meant for you. We had eagles soaring, we had um, all kinds of beautiful uh, sunlight, but we also had tremendous amount of rain, um, constantly looking and watching uh, your equipment um, you know, drying off your lens if you can. Oh my goodness, it's, it's such a challenge. It's exercising every kind of uh, sense that you have and 
not only your creativity, but also just staying in tune to animal behavior and uh, your creativity, but also just making sure that you're keeping your equipment from um, disaster. Um, you know, so again, just animals in flight, trying to capture them differently than I had ever seen before, using the light if you can um, to eliminate your subjects, maybe backlight, maybe side light, whatever it is that you can do, always trying to create using the light um, in a different way. We had sea otters. That was also so much fun. Oh my goodness, I, I think I have a thousand photos of sea otters, um, their behavior. But again, you know, you're in the choppy waters, close to the rocks, you're on a fishing boat, you've got the 800, um, you've got rain, you've got all these elements happening at you. None of this is easy. I have to say, um, I should probably show the hundred photos that I have when the animals are completely right out of my frame um, because of boat movement or whatever. Um, gosh, I can't tell you how many times that I maybe swore a little bit you know, going up and down and you think you have the right moment and then all of a sudden the boat moves and then you move and, and it's out of frame. Uh, anyway, just, just because digital, because you can shoot as much as you can. And that's what my motto is. And, and I just take the chances when I can because you never know when you might have them again. Uh, super cool to see the sea otters out of the water, hauled out. Um, that was really neat as well. Uh, they look so completely different out of the water as well. The sea lions, the California, the stellar sea lions, having the snow-capped mountains in the background, their behavior, watching them, um, jumping off the rocks, trying to get on, being the dominant, having those, come, you know, those fights on the rocks, um, so much fun. And again, you're in a boat, you've got movement, you've got a long lens to have, uh, so much activity and just really staying in tune. I think that's what I try to do. I, I, I try to just stay focused on a scene and create that because we can get so overwhelmed with so much that is happening around us all the time. Getting in a little bit closer, trying to again, get that emotional uh, impact, um, that, that interaction between the two animals or three or four um, really honing in on a, on a scene to see what you can create in reaction and, uh, and, uh, and impact as well. These are surf scoters. I've never seen them before. They were in the thousands. They would fly and then they would all take off. The sounds uh, were incredible that they would make when they would take off. And again, there were just so many animals together, so many of these birds. Um, I ended up putting the two times extender on and trying to get a little bit closer with the 800. So I was working with 1600 millimeter with my Z6. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of frames, lots of opportunity. Um, and, uh, and then when they would take off, I was really trying to anticipate, okay, we're getting closer. They, you know, one or two start to fly off and then three or four and then 10 and then 100 and then they all start to fly off together. So just shooting and trying to find that motion and create it. And this was taken again with the with the 802 times. And uh, lucky enough that I got the eye of the scoter right in the middle of the frame. But it took so many to get to get this kind of shot. We had the cormorants, the using the light to uh, to capture the iridescence in their in their in their feathers. Um, and and then we left. I mean, it was we had gray whale. We had so much activity. We had. Yeah, um, just magnificent draw dropping, awe inspiring scenery, and uh, and we left there on March 13th, and and uh, we flew through the mountains to get back to um, to Vancouver, and you know it kind of felt like we went into a, a black and white world, and um, you know I remember landing and the feeling the ominous. Uh, uh, spirit around and, and how quiet people were. We were getting photos of empty store shelves and people buying the toilet paper and, um, you know, just what the future was so unknown. March break was basically called off for so many people and uh, we were told to self-isolate. We were told to stay at home. Um, we were told to get home if you were away. And um, yeah, it was, I'll never, I'll never forget being in this beautiful, magnificent place and hearing every day how things were changing and how school was going to be closed for another two weeks and the uncertainty, I guess, and really feeling like we stepped into uh, a black and white world after being in this uh, magnificent beauty. 
And uh, so I got home, I quarantined for two weeks. I self-isolated for five weeks. And any time that I could, I went outside. If it snowed, because you know if you live in Ottawa, we had snow up until two weeks ago. Hard to believe when you've got um, a heat wave going on right now. But any time that I had um, a rain or snow or opportunity, uh, which I had a lot of because everything was canceled, I went outside to try to create even snow, uh, even snow, even rain, uh, the raindrops um, on trees. I took out my macro lens. Um, I just needed to stay creative. I needed to get out of the uncertainty and the scared feelings that I was having and the loss of my business, the loss of travel. I was supposed to be in Africa next week with Exodus and Canadian Geographic and my Arctic travels that uh, were potentially canceled. Like we just, we were dealing with so much just getting out and, and finding the ordinary and finding the extraordinary in everything that we see. And that's a true gift as well, is that when you walk out your door, even if it's in your, not in your backyard, but in your park, somewhere close to home that you can see everyday animals and see them maybe a little bit differently and take your camera out. And, and you know, that's the beauty of photography. It gives us the opportunity to see and, uh, and to maybe see things that we don't, or we walk by on a typical day. I, even this, I was sitting at my computer and I saw a bird fly the window. I looked out and it was a flicker, it was a northern flicker. And uh, it was in my garden. So I ran outside with my camera. I thought, well, I might as well try, it probably leaves. But it, it stayed and, and it stuck around. And I snuck around and, and I guess it didn't see me. And it, it, uh, this is a video that I took. Um, it was eating the ants out of our, out of our um, interlocking stone. I didn't even know what it was doing. Uh, this is taken with a 500 millimeter with the slow-mo, so I'm, I'm shooting it at about 750 millimeter. And uh, the slow-mo allows you a little bit of forgiveness as well. Um, but super, super cool to see this kind of behavior from a bird that I absolutely love and that is typical that flies away. Um, you know, so again, just finding the opportunities. We went for walks every day. We continue to walk almost every day. And uh, we went for, uh, I went for a walk with my husband and son and dog and and the property right next to us, uh, Scott said, oh, there's there's a fox and no, there's Kit. So wasn't I in delight because I still had the 800 millimeter that I borrowed from, from, from Nikon and uh, with the two times extender and the bean bag, I was able to stay at a safe distance, not interfere with the animals and shoot right out of my car, right off of the road. Um, and, uh, but it meant getting up at 5.30, five o'clock in the morning, getting my coffee, getting in the car, driving like two minutes. I, I never in a million years would have ever imagined, but it took time as well to develop a relationship that this fox um, knew that I was okay. She was fully aware that I was there, but she, uh, she still managed to come and feed her cubs, look at me and feel comfortable. But it took a few days for me to develop this relationship with her as well. Um, the, the kids didn't know that I, I was there, but she certainly did. And it was incredible to be able to shoot with this long lens with a two times extender and be completely unintrusive, like, you know, um, quiet uh, and not interfering with any of their behavior. Again, you know, without COVID, I would have never had this opportunity to see wildlife getting closer to our city limits and and perhaps denning or, or nesting in places that they don't typically typically nest. Um, being able to see, uh, I went out every morning, every night, uh, I was obsessed, but I could because I was at home. And um, I was trying to find every kind of opportunity to just go and, uh, and photograph them. I watched mom bring a, a, a duck a squirrel, a red squirrel, black squirrel, uh, robin, a cardinal. She kept bringing them animals and birds, and I just kept shooting and watching and watching their behavior. Uh, at, I have a cottage at Charbor Lake as well, and I uh, fortunately have a wonderful neighbor that has allowed me on his property to photograph the the fox den that he has. Thank you, uh, Bruce, for that. And uh, I got this full-on hide, like my new look. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Anyway, um, you know what? You can actually spend time with these animals. They have no idea that you're there unless you're downwind and they, they smell you. But 
um, you know, you can be, again, pretty, uh, pretty quiet, pretty uh, uh, um, quiet. Well, I don't know. They don't see you. <laughs> Um, so I got to spend time again, getting up really early in the morning, being patient. Wildlife photography, there's nothing more than you need is patience to sit there and wait for, for the behavior to, to happen. Um, this little kid had uh, a garter snake and there were five kids in this family and they were all fighting for this garter snake. Um, and again, just, you know, anticipating, waiting and hoping that they are going to do something and, and be in full view for you to be able to photograph. And as we all know, as wildlife photographers, it's, it's the ultimate when you, can, when you can get something like that to happen. This I took uh, outside of Ottawa, it's a, a rookery, and I was shooting with the 800 with the two times extender with a DX crop. So I was actually shooting at 3,200 3, millimeters. And there is the blue heron bringing a uh, meal to it's chicks, not exactly pretty, but uh, wow, a behavior I had never seen before. So typically this is where I am. I'm in my kayak at the cottage. I'm waiting for the loons to come out uh, or not come out, but hopefully have a successful uh, nesting season and, um, and a couple of chicks, I fingers, fingers crossed for them um, that they're successful, but I've already been out, I've been photographing a blue heron. I even saw this beautiful doe. Um, again, you know, just being quiet on the water, being out early, early in the morning. And, uh, you know, I'd never seen this before. Also, uh, a muskrat. I had never seen and been able to photograph a muskrat before, muskrat before. Uh, and he was eating away right in front of me. It was like he didn't know I was there, went under the water, came up beside me, and we scared each other. So just get out there because even if you think you know what's out there, you don't, right? We always see things differently if you actually spend the time um, out there looking, observing, and, and just being patient and waiting for something to happen to you. So I'm going to end with my, after my five weeks isolation and getting out and photographing wildlife, I decided that I needed to do something a little bit more. I wanted to go downtown. I wanted to see what the streets were like. History was in the making. Um, I wanted to see the empty streets. I wanted to see what this was like. I wanted to feel it as hard as it was uh, walking the streets, seeing the empty businesses, looking into the windows, seeing what was once bustling uh, city life and just being desolate and so incredibly quiet, eerie. Um, I ran into a friend of mine. She, uh, Mandy Agoswich, owns a store on Byward Market called Stunning Accessories. Ran into her. We shared a beautiful uh, a moment uh, of just, you know, seeing somebody you knew uh, as tearful and, and um, sad, I guess, in a way that it was. Uh, we were, um, you know, still in the unknown stages as business people, not knowing what was ahead. Um, you know, she's usually a vibrant, beautiful uh, person, not that she isn't here, but she just isn't as vibrant as she normally is, let's just say, and even her dog looks a little sad as well. I asked her if I could take her portrait and that just catapulted me into a series that I called Planet of Hope. I photographed the firefighter with her um, breathing apparatus on. This is how they have to go to medical calls. I photographed um, all kinds of frontline workers, including a paramedic, a PSW working with Rick. Um, this is a young PSW as well that had actually moved into a retirement residence to be closer to the people that she works with daily because her mother is immune compromised. So she, uh, in order to keep her mother safe, she had to move to this residence. Talk about commitment. Thank goodness. Thank you all uh, frontline workers that are out there putting themselves at risk. And please, please, please make sure that you social distance and, and we abide by all that we we're being told because it's so critical that we don't go into a, a phase two that is, uh, is even more critical, uh, and, and even more dangerous. Nurses, this is Doug from CHEO, uh, Dr. Slaughter from Queen's Lake Carlton, emergentologist um, with what, how, she, how she sees her patients. Craig who makes shields and has turned his printing company into now a, uh, a um, he's transformed his printing company to making shields and uh, sees uh, guards for companies, amazing work. Julie, who makes masks uh, and has 
galvanized the number of people taking them out of unemployment and giving them employment to make masks for all of us. Zoe, who, who lost her graduation, she's a graduating student this year, um, to you know, Sasha and her brother who lost their mother during this and, uh, and have to you know, wait for a funeral to celebrate her life. I mean, it's just tragic what they had to go through. Uh, bus drivers, the changes that they've had to make. Um, even Margaret Atwood makes an appearance in Planet Hope and my son, uh, Ben, representing you. Um, and this today is Joe, who is the owner of Polka Dot Lagoon and Sally, it's World Hunger Day uh, today. And uh, he lost Polka Dot Lagoon to fire. And he is part of this incredible volunteer network donating his restaurant downtown to feeding the hunger, uh, feeding the hunger, feeding the hungry. Amazing, amazing. Uh, we are so blessed uh, to have these people that continue to work and support us and allow us to be uh, to be uh, somewhat productive during this time. And uh, thank you to all of you who have have served us and continue to give back in so many different ways. I hope you that uh, that you will maybe um, join me in the series on Instagram on Planet Hope Canada or through my Facebook page, Michelle Valbert Photography. Um, anyway, I have really rambled on it. What time is it? It's eight o'clock. Wow, it doesn't take long for me to fill up an hour. I have conversation. I'm, <laughs> I, it's not hard as people know with me. But um, anyway, thank you. If you're still here and you still stay tuned in, um, thank you for, for staying through this, uh, this conversation. And uh, I'm here to answer any questions if we still have time, Alex. And um, yeah, again, thank you to everybody. I'm just so incredibly grateful. Thank you so much, Michelle. We absolutely have time for questions and I have a ton of questions that have come in on the live chat while you were speaking. So if you just wanna unshare your screen, we can oh. both be having a, a conversation. Okay. And if you, if you have a question for Michelle that you haven't asked yet, please, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Angelica is watching and she's feeding the questions to me via text message. So here we are. Is that back? Am I back? You're back. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> so our first question is from someone that you know really well, Aaron Kiley. Aaron, thank you so much for watching again. <laughs> Hopefully um, the family is watching. So he wants to know, um, even though they're vastly different in many obvious ways, what similarities did you see between Africa and Canada's North? Uh, the beauty, um, the vastness, um, and also because of the herring run, I think the, the, the amount of biodiversity, uh, the amount of what happens in these areas uh, outside of the city. And yeah, they were, they were so vastly different, like you said, but incredibly the same that you're just seeing uh, these animals in their environment in so many numbers. Cool. And Javier, who you also know, uh, <laughs> wants to know, do you shoot on silent mode when you're as close to wildlife as you were in Uganda when you were with the gorillas? Yeah, thank you, Javier, because you know how much I love silent mode. I mean, this is the transformation with, with, um, with mirrorless. Being able to be with these animals, whether you, I was in Uganda or if I'm on my kayak, like if I, the perfect example was the muskrat. If I was clicking away with the DSLR, there is no way that I would have had that time. So I think that I have less interference with the animals when I'm in silent mode, but also I have more time. And I think that's a real gift. I know that I have created imagery that if I had the sound of the shutter, there's no way that I would have I would have had that time with those animals. So hugely transformative for, for me. And ever since I picked up my first DSLR, sorry, my first mirrorless from my DSLR, I haven't gone back. Um, and I only shoot with mirrorless because of that. Maybe for the, the non-photography initiated folks who might be watching, you could just quickly explain what the difference is between mirrorless and regular DSLR. Well, the DSLR has a mirror, so when you trigger the shutter, the mirror the mirror goes up to um, to expose. So, with the mirrorless, you're straight through, so there's no sound of the shutter. 
Um, so it's a, it's, um, it's a way that you're able to look through the viewfinder and see your exposure live as well. So um, I'm seeing exactly what I'm getting. So one of the other benefits is that you're not chimping, no pun intended, but you don't have to take your eye off of the camera, off of the viewfinder and look at the back of the camera to see if your exposure is right, um, how you're producing your images. You're seeing it firsthand. So that as well is a huge benefit to the mirrorless and being in the field. I think I create more and I'm more aware of how my light is affecting my subject as well. And with my Planet Hope series, one of the amazing opportunities because I, I, I felt like I was in this black and white world, being able to look through your viewfinder and be using a picture control, you're able to see black and white. I mean, that to me, like you're not shooting in color and then looking on the back of the camera to see black and white, you're actually seeing in black and white. And that I think is, is helped me create these, uh, these portraits in a way that I probably would have not created. I really have to say, if I saw it in color, I wouldn't have seen, um, I wouldn't have seen what I am seeing now. So huge amount of benefits in shooting, um, uh, shooting mirrorless as well. The last thing I'm going to say is it makes video very easy because you're able to shoot video while looking through your viewfinder as well. Very cool. Thanks for explaining that. Um, so Virginia McDonald wants to know, how did you end up a photographer in residence for CanGeo? <laughs> <laughs> By submitting to the photo club. I I started submitting to the photo club many, many years ago. And I remember the first time that I submitted polar bear sparring and I was chosen as photo of the day. And I think that that's so important to be along to a club. And when you're photographing or in a club, especially in Canada, when you're photographing a lot of wildlife in Canada, uh, being able to be amongst your peers and your colleagues and your, your like-minded friends, I think it's awesome. So I kept submitting to Canadian Geographic and um, I, can, I, I will never forget. And then I started submitting to the contest as well. So you, Canadian Geographic magazine started to notice, uh, to notice my work. And then I did a couple of speaking engagements and, and it snowballed from there. So as a photographer, get yourself out there, um, get your work out there, submit to uh, contests. Um, it's a great way to learn. Use social media, belong to the uh, CanGeo Photo Club. Um, and just, yeah, it's a great way to learn. And then you're inspired as well from the other people that are submitting. And uh, it's a chance for you to, to get your name out there and to get your, your work known as well. Well, wow, that's so great. And I'm so glad you brought up the photo club. Um, and I'll just put in a plug for anyone who's watching, who's curious about what Michelle is talking about. You can go to photoclub.canadiangeographic.ca and it's completely free to join. And you can just share your images with us. Um, we do look at it every single day. We often go in there and uh, look for images to use with our online stories on our social media, in the magazine. So it is a really awesome way to get your work in front of the editors and the creative director of CanGeo. And uh, we do have competitions regularly. We have one running right now. Um, you can find more details about that at the club. So definitely consider joining. And <laughs> thanks, Michelle, for that that great plug for the club it's it's really awesome um it's such a great community it's everyone's really supportive they they give a lot of constructive feedback um on your images so it's definitely yeah. worth checking out okay so toma 10 who um asked this question on instagram actually before the talk wants to know who are your top three uh female inspirational photographers oh wow i have a lot more than three <laughs> Um, for portraits, you know, I, I uh, in the current time, I love uh, and still do Annie Leibovitz and uh, her her work. Um, for wildlife uh, and documentary, uh, Amy Vitali for sure. Uh, she is a, a dear friend and um, and somebody that I just admire. And she has the heart of gold. And um, uh, she really photographs with her with her heart and soul, and it really shines through. Uh, and Christina Mittemeyer for um, for her work um, all over the world with her work with Sea Legacy and Paul Nicklin. Um, you know, top of mind, there's so many others um, that I can can name as well, but uh, you know, I can't, I can't, you just ask me for three. So those are three top of mind. And if you don't follow any of them, 
please do. There's Deanna Fitzmorris too, and um, Carol Guzzi and Jody Cobb, and yeah, there's. See, I said I wasn't gonna do it, and I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's a great list to get people going and searching out uh, the people who've inspired Michelle. <laughs> yeah. Okay, another Instagram question is from Alison Fuiz. She wants to know, what tips do you have for kids getting into photography? Oh, that's a good one. Um, yeah, just encouraging them. And there's so much online learning as well right now. Um, you know, like what Canadian Geographic is doing with the Cangio Talks and uh, creative live there's all kinds of online learning so you know just encouraging them to get out there and to shoot to go into the backyard to see um, you know and and to you have a youth competition as well right and um, not that it's all about competition all the time but just get them absorbed into it and if if they really love it as they have to learn their their craft and um, you know, social media and Instagram, there's, there's so many ways. I'm constantly looking at my page um, because the people that I follow and I, I just am learning about places that I want to go visit. And this is a, also an amazing opportunity for kids to learn. Um, you know, every time we have an assignment, right, Alex, like we learn something new about, about a place that, that we get to go photograph. So photography offer, offers that wonderful that wonderful learning experience as well. So if you have a young one, just as much learning, get them online, um, you know, find, uh, find basic photography courses, get them a, a learning, uh, you know, a learning camera, get them to really understand the technical side as well, work through it and, uh, you know, um, yeah, shoot as much as you can. I still, I've been doing this for over 32 years and, and I still have to, I'm obsessed with shooting, but I am, I'm learning all the time, all the time. And it's mostly learning from not only shooting, but from, from other people as well. Great. Uh, another IG question, um, Just Stunts is the handle and he wants to know, do you work with local guides who watch your back when you're shooting in those situations like in Africa? Yes, thank you for that. Yes, definitely. Um, especially in, in uh, these, um, uh, it could be dangerous situations, always making sure that you're uh, with a guide that knows the animals, uh, knows their behavior, knows the area, um, has protective gear for you, maybe, um, you know, bear spray or a paddle or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so, so important to make sure that you're, you're out there with your guides and um, that you're not putting yourself in danger because that's not any good, but you also don't want to put the animal in danger either and uh, any, any, any harm to come to them because of the, our behavior. So yes, always very, very important. Thank you for bringing that up because um, it's critical. Perfect. And uh, going back to the questions that were coming in on the, the YouTube chat, uh, Amy Newport wants to know, kind of related to the, the, the last question, if you've ever had an experience where you were afraid to be close to the wildlife. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, and it was with a, with a polar bear and I, I can't get into that long story, but yeah, I was almost charged by a polar bear, but fortunately I was behind my guide who had a gun. Um, yeah. And, and you can't, you can control how much approach you have, but you can't control how much approach the animal has. So, um, you know, if, if that animal has intent and in coming closer, then you have to just make sure that you are either in a good position with your guide or you back off or, you're not there to begin with, I guess. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's really important to make sure that you're you're fully aware of your surroundings and that you have somebody there to to help in these situations as well. You can't, you know, like we didn't know that the polar bear was going to to come as close as it did and potentially charge. So you never you never ever want uh, behavior uh, to result in the fact that you know what we've done has harmed that animal. Hmm. Great. And Je <laughs> Dennis Jackson. <laughs> Hi, Jen Dennis. <laughs> Dennis Jackson wants to know, what are your go-to editing or post-processing programs? Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. I use Photoshop. I'm a Photoshop girl. I'm in Lightroom a little bit, but it's mostly all Photoshop. And I, you know, when you think about the days of when you had film and you put it in a bag and it went to the store and it came back and you had no control. The, the beauty now is that your camera can do a really great job in getting and producing that image, but it's up to us to take that image to that final level and 
you know, whether it's just a little bit of sharpening, maybe it might be some um, uh, bringing in your shadows or, or helping your shadows out or your highlights. It's critical right now these days to be working in post-production. There's no doubt. Your images are only so much coming out of the camera. You really need to make sure that you're, if you want to stand out, that your images are further above, beyond just cam out of camera. Much like we did with the darkroom, right? We bur burned and dodged and and um, and we used contrast filters. I mean, it was the same. It was the same level of what we used to have to do in the darkroom. Now we have just well, not the same level at all. We have so many opportunities now. It's ridiculous and how far. But we also have to make sure we don't take our images too far either. So it's just finding that that balance and making sure that um, yeah, you're you're using your programs to just enhance your images rather than, you know, manipulate, let's just say. So I use Photoshop. Long answer, Dana, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was great. It's good to go into some detail about, you know, what your process actually is and, um, you know, what these tools can do to really make an image pop. Um, one final question that I'm curious in about uh, where would you like to travel when it's okay for us to travel again? And as a, as a subsequent follow-up to that, do you think that COVID will have changed the way you approach um, travel and, and the travel that you were doing before this? Well, COVID has changed everything. Like I, you know, like, like everybody, um, having missed the opportunity now to be in Africa this month, this coming month, um, South Africa, uh, Namibia, Botswana, and Zimbabwe. Um, what a trip that would have been. And I know there were a lot of disappointed people, but um, also I was supposed to be in Norway, uh, Greenland and Iceland, and then the Northwest Passage. So um, a, lot of, a lot of sadness when I think too hard about um, what uh, is missing out of my year. Um, there's still, you know, polar bears in November that I'm hopeful for. Um, but, you know, it's just day to day, really, of trying to figure out what the world is going to look like. Um, having not been able to shoot uh, for an income as well. I mean, like many people, it's just everything that I had known has, has gone. Um, so just for me, it's redefining, uh, looking at ways that I can contribute, um, like Planet Hope, keep myself creative, keep myself happy creating and giving as much as I can with my work. I don't know what, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, I'm supposed to go to Antarctica maybe uh, in next, next uh, January, February. You know, there's just so much unknown that I, I really don't know where I, I would spend time. I would encourage everyone to spend time in Canada. We have so much opportunity here in every province, in every territory, we have such beauty. You don't need to go anywhere. So if you can't travel abroad or into the US, stay in Canada, there's lots to see here. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to be really happy with my boys and my dog and the cottage and, and my kayak and the herons and the loons and the birds and, and uh, yeah, whatever I, can, whatever I can find just in my own, in my own space. Cause I think that, is a real gift to be able to um, not be forced by any means. We are forced to stay and stay put, but you know, I could choose to stay on my computer or in the house, which I, you know, I do often. But I try as much as I can to to get out and, and enjoy. So I would recommend that to everybody. That's okay. a long answer, and I didn't really answer actually. I don't think well, I well, kind of. <laughs> It was, it was well said. <laughs> I just don't know. I just want everyone to be safe. I want everyone to be ha healthy and I don't want to see a second wave. And I, I think uh, our community is pretty amazing as I'm sure everybody's communities are. They're stepping up and wow, what, what spirit that we're seeing. It's, it's, uh, that's been the greatest gift for me and the amount of people that want to work and that are working and that continue to work including my husband, who's a fire chief, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's on the front lines too. So thank you to all of you uh, for working through, through this. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, Michelle, for an amazing and candid and so inspiring presentation. Um, this has been really wonderful. I hope everyone watching has enjoyed 
spending the last hour and a bit with us. Um, <laughs> no, don't apologize. It was great. Um, and uh, of course, if you enjoyed what you saw, um, please do consider making that donation to the RCGS so we can keep our online programming going and our educational programming. And uh, don't forget, if you want a subscription, Michelle's promo code is HOPE30. So it's inspired by her Planet Hope series. And you can enter that at canadiangeographic.ca slash subscribe to get 30% off your magazine subscription. And I hope we'll see many of you back here on Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern for the live final of the Cangio Challenge. It's going to be really, really super fun. So thank you and have a great night, everyone, and stay safe. Bye.